I, I will go ahead and kick us off then if we're ready. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're just after noon, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the October COVID Info Commons Research Webinar. My name is Lauren Close, and I'm the Operations and Communications Manager for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub here at Columbia University. I'm also a member of the COVID Information Commons project team. And the COVID Information Commons, or KIC, is a COVID-19 research collaboration platform brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs and found funded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. Every month, KIC brings together scholars from all over the country to share their research findings in the form of lightning talks. Each scholar today will also engage the community directly, answering questions about their work during a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. But before I introduce you to today's really fantastic group of speakers, I'd like to first invite the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub's Executive Director, Florence Hudson, to say just a few words about the kick. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lauren. And welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, as we say. So we're delighted to have you join us again, or maybe for the first time, for the COVID Information Commons PI Lightning Talks. And we do these webinars pretty much every month, as Lauren said. And we began these in July of 2020. Uh, we were very fortunate that the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub headquartered at Columbia University and representing the Northeast US um, partnered with the South Big Data Hub out of uh, Georgia Tech in North Carolina, which handles the South of the country, the US, uh, the West Big Data Hub out of California and the University of Washington, as well as the Midwest Big Data Hub at uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which covers the Midwestern US. We partnered together and we submitted a proposal to NSF for a rapid award and we received um, the COVID Information Commons Award, which we're really delighted about. And it was created as um, a, an open resource to explore NSF funded research addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. It quickly, actually immediately, when we had our kickoff meeting in July of 2020, became a very collaborative community. We had 178 people show up, which totally shocked us. And we had 42 PIs offer to present their research. Um, so we said, well, welcome to the COVID Info Commons community. <laughs> we are now a community and we'll get together every month since that's what you would like. Um, since then, we've expanded the COVID Info Commons. We actually have a really cool machine learning map tool. Um, so if you go to covidinfocommons.net, you can see here the click for COVID Research Explorer ML maps and it has a clustering mechanism. So you could look at categories of awards in certain topical areas. And you can also drill down by award and put special Boolean uh, in there to tell it what you wanna look at. The NSF COVID award and PI database, we added um, October of last year. So about a year ago, when we have 990 awards in there that are all NSF funded awards at this time. You can look at the PI lightning talks. You can, um, the PIs can actually provide information in a survey. We have their ORCID ID, links to their research, Search, um, and abstracts, obviously, and keyword collaboration uh, search opportunities so you can see if you want to collaborate. This was funded by the NSF Convergence Accelerator, which is a, a group in NSF that goes, um, is kind of a cross-director group. It's in the office of the director because this is multidisciplinary because this COVID research is funded by every director in NSF. So we're very excited <laughs> that um, on the next page you can see that we were granted an extension to the COVID Info Commons that began October 1st. Um, we have the kick as the COVID Info Commons, this we call the kicky, <laughs> the COVID Info Commons extension for pandemic recovery. And so in this next phase, which is a four year, $2 million award, we're growing the COVID Information Commons beyond the initial 990 NSF awards funded by um, um, related to COVID, and we're adding all the NIH awards related to COVID um, and all the new NSF awards that will be funded by the American Rescue Plan Act. So by the middle of 2022, there will be thousands of awards in the corpus, and you'll be able to search on all the different aspects of those. We also plan on adding um, a new novel uh, metadata and data search and discovery mechanism. The way we have it right now in the COVID Info Commons, as you could see um, past the about side, you know, then the search tools we talked about um, and opportunities and resources. If you go in there, you can see about 
I don't know, 50 to 70 data sets from around the planet that we vetted that you can connect to, but it's just a link. What we're planning in this extension over the next four years is to create this new data and metadata search and discovery mechanism. So if you put a keyword in like where you see it says search the awards and PI database, it doesn't just go against the corpus of the abstracts and metadata about the NSF and NIH awards. Hopefully it'll crawl all that, those other sources. And so you can actually identify valuable and pertinent data and metadata related to your research area. So we're very excited about that. We're very grateful to NSF and the Convergence Accelerator for funding this. Um, and we hope to be working with all of you even more into the future as we do this. Another thing that we'll continue to do, it will continue to do these webinars. Um, we also have this Meet the Researchers tab. And so if you go there on the website, you'll actually be able to see the separate PI Lightning Talks. We split them up from each of these webinars. So if someone wants to look at your Lightning Talk, they can look at it, um, or a particular researcher that you know of that does a particular type of research. And you can also look at the webinars. So we have all this on YouTube. We have all these videos. Um, we're actually transcribing them and putting them in the COVID Academic Commons so people can read them if um, they don't hear. And we're also looking at maybe expanding into American Sign Language um, to transcribe some of the talks as well. So we're trying to make this information as accessible as possible because we really see this as, you know, it's 2021, it'll be 2022 soon, and we're still calling this COVID-19. This is a longitudinal problem. Um, and we expect that, you know, there will be other pandemics and at the confluence of natural hazards and disasters. So there's a lot to think about and there are a lot of research to do and a lot of insights to develop. And so we're looking to continue to extend this, working with all the researchers um, and students um, such as all of you. So that's a, a little overview about um, what the COVID Info Commons is. Um, in my role and in my background in Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub as one of the four hubs I mentioned funded by the National Science Foundation, we actually um, are a collaboration hub. We do things like this. We bring people together around domain and data science areas. We have education and data literacy programs. We have a big national student data core we created that was zero humans in February, and now it's 1,700 people around the planet. Uh, we provide free online learner and educator resources for data science. We have a health focus area where the COVID Info Commons is, as well as some other research, as well as responsible data science, including security, privacy, and ethics and also urban to rural communities. So we have domain and data science areas and we bring people together, researchers, industry, nonprofits, government, students, um, to actually forward the re bring the research forward and make a difference. So that's really what our, our passion is and what our mission is. And we're delighted that you're all part of it. So Lauren, anything else I should mention before we move along? Um, I would say to bookmark and sort of bookend what you were just saying, um, because we have so many exciting projects happening at the Hub and within the COVID Info Commons, we're currently hiring or looking for applications for a KIC program manager. If you're interested, if you know someone who might be interested or a good fit, we would encourage you to check out the um, link below where you can find some additional information about this position. And it is funded by the award that we just got, which is a four-year award. So it has a nice longevity. Yes, very exciting. And we're um, looking forward to growing our team. So I will um, transition us over into today's agenda, our October uh, kick session. Um, I also wanna highlight um, that today we are gonna be joined by another Columbia University student, Isabel Graham, who's gonna be providing backend support, constructing a summary of today's proceedings to be posted on our Hub website in the coming weeks. So thank you, Isabella, for helping us out today. And with all of that being said, I wanna introduce us to today's speakers. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from four fantastic researchers who come to us from a variety of um, you know, academic backgrounds and, and academic disciplines. So we should have a really exciting and well-rounded conversation about the current state of COVID research this afternoon. Um, so I'd like to kick us off by introducing our first speaker, Susan Westmiller, who is faculty at the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing. Um, Susan, I'm going to stop sharing and let you take over and give you the floor. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to participate today. I, I'm really just delighted to be here. 
um, to because this COVID has had such an effect on my longitudinal study, talking about longitudinal studies, Dr. Hudson. Um, so I will um, talk about that. Our, um, our um, research has been focused on collecting data from women with breast cancer over the last three years. And early spring of 2020, we realized that all of a sudden we were seeing some changes that we didn't usually see uh, in, in our women um, after their surgery. So why is this significant? Um, well, first of all, COVID-19 has added a layer of complexity for participants with high symptom burden. And not accounting for the presence of the coronavirus would really lead to historical bias. So there's no way that we could publish our findings of our longitudinal studies looking at symptoms experienced by women. We're also looking at, um, at genotypes, but it's mostly the, the phenotype that, that are affected. And how do, we, how, do we, how do we account for that? So we could put an asterisk on it, or we could try to figure out how to tease it out. So we believe it's important to understand social and behavioral changes that have occurred due to emergence of the pandemic. Um, and because of that, we wrote and were funded for a COVID supplement from the National Institute of Nursing Research. Our parent study, as I said, is a longitudinal study, um, phenotyping women for one year following surgery. And we um, use those women, 144 women, for whom we have data prior to and following the emergence of the COVID-19. We were, we were actually fortunate to have this opportunity, um, even though at first when the COVID hit and we had to stop our recruitment and we had, to, had a difficult time with data collection, um, we thought, oh, geez, now we realize that, we, that there's really something here. So we were already collecting um, variables using the patient reported outcome measures, which most of you are probably familiar with, um, that are, um, have been developed by the NIH. That, and we looked at nausea and vomiting, sleep disturbance, pain, depressive symptoms, fatigue, ability to participate in social activities, anxiety, and physical function. So we have these data pre uh, Pre-COVID and post-COVID, but when we wrote our um, so when we wrote our our sup or our supplement, we wanted the purpose to be to determine the effect of COVID-19 on the symptom trajectory experienced by women with breast cancer in their first two years of survivorship, and to identify those women that are at the highest risk for symptom burden. As part of the supplement, we added, um, we first we had invited study participants to be part of a second year so that we could lengthen our longitudinal data collection. Um, and the majority of them did. Uh, we also added some variables, the Corona anxiety scale. Uh, we added resilience. We had not uh, measured resilience prior to this supplement. So we added the Connor Davids and resilience scale. We also started asking questions about living arrangements. Do you live at home? Do you live with your family? Uh, are you, do you have a spouse at home? Um, like how did it make a difference how individuals um, coped with COVID depending on their living arrangements? We also looked at household job or income loss due to coronavirus. And then we added the area deprivation index, which is um, completed by address. If you're not familiar with the area deprivation index, it is, um, it is an, a, a way to measure deprivation um, using it addresses. It's, it's a little bit more refined than zip codes, um, and it includes factors for the domains of income, education, employment, and housing quality. Um, we have found that we have a, a very, a very well, or a very broad distribution of ADI scores within our 144 ladies. So you can see that we have 30 women that are least deprived, and then we have 24 that are considered in the highest, and then uh, actually certainly more than 60% um, that are above the moderate deprivation. So our preliminary results, and this is definitely a study in progress, um, and we have so much data that we have to figure out what we're going to do with it. For those of you in, in big data, you may I may need your help. Uh, we have 144 study participants. 
Um, by October 2020, we realized that 49 participants have reported household job or income loss due to COVID, which is significant. So 35% of this population of women or this sample of women from Western Pennsylvania um, that had lost jobs. 60% of study participants, as you saw on my slide before, fought, fell above um, five on the uh, area deprivation index. And interestingly, the majority of these individuals are vaccinated. We only have nine study participants that have chosen not to be vaccinated and tell us that they do not want to be, that they have no intent um, to be vaccinated. Most of them are vaccinated, have been receiving the boosters when available. So some of the changes that we first saw, and this is um, some data that we gathered in January 2020, or it's from January 2020, um, of women that were three months post-operatively, so three months into their um, the trajectory which we're following. And we looked at women that were three months um, post-op in April 20 and compared them. And then we looked again at the same group in April of 21. So, so our, these are pre-COVID, the gold um, bars. And at that point, very seldom, like 1% women might have said they, they felt helpless um, or that they never felt helpless, I'm sorry. But by, um, by March, in looking at our post-operative women, same, same time span for the, and different groups, three months, three months, we see that they have a, almost 80%. And then when we looked at that same group this, a year later, we realized it hasn't changed much. They're still feel, feeling some hopelessness. We, the same is true. We saw a decrease in refreshing sleep as measured by the Promise 29. And that has actually gone down a little bit even um, from the, the three months right during the COVID um, pandemic when we were all sequestered at home. Fatigue has gone up and social activities have stayed low. So here's our social activity, our participation in social activities prior to COVID and then what it looks like afterwards. So we have lots of work yet to do but we are, we're still looking at those data. Um, some qualitative studies that we are looking at as well. Um, women that talked about having to cancel their chemotherapy appointments and get out of track due to COVID or working through, and these are you know people that are just a couple months after their breast cancer surgery, they're doing radiation therapy or chemo, and they're trying to hold on to their job during chemotherapy treatments because um, this, as this one woman indicates, her son and her husband had lost their job. Um, they tell us that COVID has added an extreme amount of anxiety and worry. Um, and it's been, it's been exaggerated, you know, and so it's extremely difficult to worry about dealing with breast cancer plus with COVID. And interesting, this woman was just last December, which I guess has been almost a year, but it's it set off some bells for us that we have to take a look at. And I have been the most frightened, yes, that yet this week as COVID cases spike in Westmoreland County. Westmoreland County is a county right next to Allegheny County where University of Pittsburgh is. And it made us realize that now, in addition to the, our trajectory, we're gonna need to take a look at how significant or how high were the COVID cases geographically, because in the spring of 2020, there was very little COVID in Westmoreland County, and then it has spiked as the year go on, gone on. So in a, just another piece we have to look at. So finally, you know, our data collection continues. Uh, we will be analyzing the moderating effects of resilience, living arrangements, and area deprivation on self-reported symptoms. Um, as I just said, we're going to need to recognize a geographical area, um, and we want to then complete a trajectory analysis um, to determine the impact of COVID-19 on study participants. We, it's really imperative for us to do this, to be able to tease out what are the symptoms from COVID and what are the symptoms from cancer diagnosis and treatment. 
So I thank you for your time. Um, thanks to my team members um, and my co-investigators and to um, those to the um, funding agencies. And um, just a, a little quick um, laugh, I guess. My team wanted to have their picture taken to share with you all, but we have, because at the University of Pittsburgh, we don't do anything without masks unless we're by ourselves in our office. This is the best we could do. So thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for sharing your research and uh, this wonderful photo of your team with us. Um, to our audience, I know you all have a lot of questions about presentations. As a reminder, we're hosting a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar as well. You're absolutely welcome to put your questions in the chat, um, but the, our speakers may choose to answer them um, in one go at the end okay. of um, at the end of today's presentation role. Um, so moving on, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Sami Zhang, who comes to us today from UC Irvine's School of Engineering. Sami, um, please feel free to share your screen and start your presentation. All right. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, after hearing the first talk, I truly appreciate the diversity of this type of a forum, uh, forum here. And um, perhaps it's an outlier seen here. I'm an engineer. <laughs> so uh, what you're really um, going to talk, uh, what you're really going to see is basically we're using a mathematical model to understand the risk of COVID-19 transmission through the aerosol generated by toilet flashing. So this is out of the human human realm, but we're looking at the toilet. There's a reason for this type of a research. Maybe early in the COVID-19 pandemic, you may hear some of the news and those newspaper articles will, sh will show why should you flash uh, your toilet with the lid down? And even in the science magazine showing, can you catch COVID-19 through a neighbor's toilet? So there is a lot of uh, uh, public concern or public panic regarding the transmissions through the aerosols uh, generated by toilet flashing. And uh, early on in the first SARS outbreak in Hong Kong, there is a very specific case in the multi-unit apartment building. They are considering the transmission of the first SARS is through the, the faulty vent uh, from the upstairs uh, condo that has um, a COVID patient. Well, not COVID at the time is a SARS patient. When the second uh, this uh, uh, COVID nineteen hit, there's a lot of um, concerns um, about spreading by the toilet generated aerosols. This concern is actually not um, out of the blue because we do human patient share very large quantity of SARS-CoV-2 in their feces. And the number of um, viruses um, RNA detected in the feces are up to um, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 per gram of feces. And then there was also research in the early on of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic showing that um, you can recover the viral uh, genomic information from um, um, a patient room from the toilet, from the from the railings, um, everywhere, and including the toilet um, um, air in the room of the air. So this is the primary driver for the research that we are carrying out to understand: Are there any risk if you share a toilet uh, bathroom with the with the say? sweet mate who, or a family member who have a COVID infection. So we set up two scenarios to look at this potential risk. If you see the schematic, the first scenario we're looking at, this is the infected patient who is using the toilet. And then after flashing the toilet, generate certain um, amount of aerosols. The aerosol may contain the genetic material of SARS-CoV-2. And then you have second, the healthy uh, sweet mate who also using the toilet maybe 30 minutes after. And would there be a risk for infection? Are the aerosols containing the remains of um, the viral uh, genome will be uh, potentially infectious to the second patient, uh, the second 
second uh, resident in the same suite. So that's the scenario one. The scenario two is that in all those um, multi-unit buildings, our sanitation uh, the system is basically connected, connected through this called this called the drain pipe. The drain pipe, when you flush um, the toilet, it generate it goes through the drain pipe and then traveled by gravity, but generate aerosols. But also there is also attachment to the wall of the drain pipe. Are those aerosols potentially come? Um, contain viruses um, entering into another apartment, which is can be far away from the first apartment, um, but you could have a faulty drain. There is normally a seal of the water seal to block this aerosol to enter into your bathroom. But I'm pretty sure many of you have experienced those uh, toilet drain smell if you go into an older apartment building or older hotel, it smells like the, the sewer drain smell. Actually, that is basically this water seal here is faulty. We call it faulty uh, drain scenario. In the faulty drain scenario, the aerosol from this vertical pipe can enter to your bathroom, in your restroom, in your, in your household. And this is the scenario being uh, used to analyze the Hong Kong first SARS case in, uh, um, during the first outbreak. Um, to analyze the risk of the two scenario, we first need to um, uh, collect the data. The data is basically about the concentration of the viruses in the human feces. And uh, we collect those data um, from all the clinical report and then looking at the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 load in the feces. And so you bin those numbers, those are called the probability distribution. Those are the concentrations of the SARS-CoV-2 um, in the feces. Of course, the, the concentration go all over the place. What you can do is to build, it's called a cumulated, cumulative probability function. So basically you want to understand under this curve, what is a likely concentration that can be in, uh, with the uh, toilet water in, um, in those feces. If you calculate the volume of the feces and correct them with the volume of the flashing water. So that's the second step of this model analysis. The framework of this quantitative microbial risk assessment actually is a classical um, National Academy of Science framework. And basically it involves four steps, is hazard identification, exposure assessment, dose response, and the risk characterization. So in their hazard in here, no, uh, no problem. We're looking at the hazard of, um, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater that coming in from the toilet flushing and exposure assessment involved, how do you um, expose to those um, potential hazard? If you enter the toilet room, basically you're breathing in the air, um, um, potentially contain those aerosol, which is contaminated by the SARS-CoV-2. That is basically exposure assessment that determined by how long you stay in the toilet room and then what is the concentration of the viruses in that aerosol. And then how much aerosol is generated after each toilet flashing. And the next step is a dose response. Dose response is basically expression of how many um, number of viruses enter your lung can trigger a disease response. And so there is no um, detailed dose response for the SARS-CoV-2, but there are um, animal models have been um, conducted for the, the first SARS. And so based on the concentration of the dose admitted to uh, uh, um, a mouse model, and then they can de develop a response. And that response is fitted into a mathematical model and then that is called the probability of infection is the function of the dose and other model parameters. Those mo model parameters is through a mathematical fitting of the exp 
of the dose response curve. So, and then of course, risk characterization is combining those um, exposure and dose into um, the final outcome of disease. So this is a basically an inhalation exposure model. Inhalation exposure model is expression of the dose of the viruses that may enter into your lung is determined by the concentration of the viruses in the flushing water. And then the aerosol generated in, uh, from the toilet flushing. And how do you breathe? Some people is a oral breather, the other is nasal breather, and then depends on, are you excited? If you're excited, your, your, um, the air cycles you breathe in are very different. So, so those are published by the um, by um, US EPA um, according to a truly study of human breathing patterns. And the duration in the toilet room, again, is a very important factor to come together and then you can determine the total dose of exposure. The dose response curve you're seeing here, that is the pathogen dose, that's the infectious risk. This dose response model is developed based on the SARS-CoV-1, the first and SARS in there. And then you fit this mathematical function, you uh, can generate exposure function. This function is best fitted by exponential function. So this is the dose, and then the R is the best fit factor from the response model. Putting all those together, basically what we also need is basically the dose here. The dose here is one of the most um, um, sort of a tricky uh, research in this area because report of the fecal loading in patients um, depends on which research paper you're looking at, how many patients, what phase of the patient is. Um, so in the towards the end of um, the patient's um, uh, recovery, actually they're show, showing very high load of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses in their feces. And then so what you can do is basically collect those data and fit them into a probability distribution. So this in the X axis here is a dose per exposure event. I have several data sets and then being used to fit this distribution function. And then so if you use one set of the data, you'll get a curve look like this. And then I also have a worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is collected in a hospital bathroom um, during the peak of pandemic in the city of Wuhan. So this concentration in the aerosol here is the really high concentration, but um, you can see the, um, the probability is high, the concentration is high. The last bar graph uh, you're seeing here is a back calculation of the dose from the scenario in the Hong Kong uh, first SARS outbreak. So those are pretty high um, number in here. So those are different data. This is the data from the toilet flushing scenario. Basically, you're sharing a same bathroom with the sweet maid who is a um, COVID patient. And this is the faulty drain scenario that you are living downstairs of a COVID family, COVID uh, uh, infected family. Look at the differences in the probability density uh, in the Y scale here. And so the faulty dream scenario has a lower um, probability and has a lower uh, um, dose per exposure event. So putting all those four pieces together, this is the basic the risk of infection in the two different scenarios. The data, the outcome here is a little bit uh, challenge to, to look, um, to understand here. The first, um, the top you're looking at here is two different scenario. That's the scenario one, if you're sharing a same bathroom. Scenario B is you're in a different apartment building, uh, in a different apartment completely with the patient. And then the, the Y axis here is a locked-in illness risk. 
And how do you read this 10 to the minus three is basically uh, one of the 1000 chance you have a risk of infected by COVID-19. Um, so the different colored box plot here is basically a different data set. And this is all about SARS-CoV-2 in here. The worst case scenario, even in the worst case scenario of those data collected from the bathroom aerosol in, um, in Wuhan, and then use the risk you are exposed to is 10 to the minus six. So one in a um, 100,000 chance is uh, you can get infection, that's a medium value. And in normal scenario, in the regular scenario, one chance of exposure is one, it's 10 to the minus 10, it's extremely low. So if you don't know the EPA, normal acceptable, acceptable risk is 10 to the minus four is right here. And then so Sunny. this result shows Sunny, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure that there's enough time left in today's presentation for our other yeah. speakers. Do you think um, we could transition to our next presentation or you have a couple more slides? I, I'm pretty much done. And okay. then this is okay. my summary. Great. Thank um, you. So the summary is basically say you don't need to worry so much about this potential risk. And uh, um, the only, you know, uh, problem is you need to get more data to have a, a better understanding of the, um, the load of the viruses. So I'm going to wrap up with that. Thank all the funding agency and then the team and you guys. Thank you so That's much, Sunny. I, I We really appreciate your um, sharing your research with us. And I know there's lots of questions in the chat. So we're really excited to get to those when we're done with everyone else's presentations. Um, I'd like to next welcome uh, Cassian, uh, who's, who's joining us today from the University of Texas at the Anderson Cancer Center. Um, Cassian, if you'd um, like to go ahead and get us started, we'd um, love to hear your presentation. Uh, can you guys all see the screen, by the way? And you can hear me okay? Sorry, I had to put the ears on. There's a little bit of a ambient noise. And uh, um, I, I know the titles change a little bit, but uh, this is um, uh, a slide that uh, describes the topic of this particular discussion, um, which is really looking at another aspect of COVID immunity. Most people have been fixated on uh, neutralizing antibodies and serologic response. Um, and I think um, as a testament to the um, flexibility and agility of NIH, there was probably an oxymoron, but I think in, in this particular case, it, it turned out uh, that we were able to um, repurpose our lab and the supplemental uh, funding provided by the NIH to uh, shift from uh, our pancreatic cancer work to COVID-19 work. Um, this is a busy slide, but I think I only want to point out two things here. One is that uh, the coronavirus family includes non-pathogenic viruses. Some of you uh, recognize these, uh, this nomenclature, and then also the pathogenic coronaviruses, um, the SARS, uh, the MERS, and then the SARS-CoV-2, which we're discussing here. Um, just brief biology so that you can understand which structures we're talking about when we talk about T-cell responses. And the spike glycoprotein is what binds to the uh, ACE uh, uh, receptor and, and delivers the um, the virus, sorry about that. I don't know if I can go back on slide. Uh, kind of messed up there, there we go. Um, but then the, the coronavirus obviously has RNA, uh, nucleocapsid uh, envelope. Um, and so we're going to talk about structural versus non-structural proteins. And most of the antibody response is directed against structural proteins like the spike glycoprotein protein and S protein or S response, which most um, IgM, IgA, IgG uh, serologic assays are, are directed against. So this is, uh, again, I'm just going to ask you to focus on uh, three things here. One is uh, the antigen load in purple. Uh, hopefully this is a successful uh, response uh, in which the antigen load increases, induces both uh, antibody and T-cell responses and then angelo decreases now obviously in long covid or in covid that doesn't respond to this oh sorry i did it again um and uh, you're going to see uh, the angelo persist and that uh, correlates with transmissibility um what i'm focused on is this t-cell response in the light blue here uh, this is a little bit um, misleading because um, this does not represent um, what you see here um, necessarily a productive or protective response. It's just a structural measure of the antibody. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on here is, is let's 
uh, dissect the T cell response a little more closely. And the question is, why are we interested in finding T cell epitopes to SARS-CoV-2 um, analysis going on its own? Okay, and, and the reason is because we want to understand the natural history of T cell immunity. It's much harder to measure T cell immunity than it is to measure serologic response. Um, and then plus, if you measure these responses properly, maybe we'll predict um, whether you're protected or not, or how bad um, uh, it can go for a particular individual and also the effect of uh, certain interventions. So um, this is a paper actually, just one year's work, one and a half year's work, I, I have to um, really uh, um, commend uh, Dr. K. Pan and Dr. Yulin Chu in the lab who um, really drilled this research uh, in a very difficult time and uh, it's coming out in NAS uh, very closely. Um, sorry, I need a time check. How much time do I have? Because I forgot. Do I have five minutes or 10 minutes? You have uh, 10 minutes and you're about three minutes in. So you have Great. plenty of time okay. to expand. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to not give you too much of a pressured speech here, <laughs> but I do want to point out one very important aspect here, which is that when you're looking at when you're looking at the T cell response, you're looking at a bit of protein that's brought onto the surface of the cell, um, which is um, a nine amino acid sequence, nine, a nine mer, uh, a length peptide, um, or um, or fourteen mer if it's a class two CD8 response. I'm just going to focus on the class one CD8 T cell response. So CD8 T cell uh, through its T cell receptor recognizes a nine amino acid peptide sequence brought to the surface, which is um, bits and pieces of a protein. Now that protein can come from anywhere, come from the surface, come from a, a non-structural proteins, come from transcription factors, what have you. Um, so the T cell response is much broader than a potential antibody response. And, and the problem is that you can't predict what this is just by doing silicon analysis. And I think that is the whole point of this discussion in the paper is that if you want to find out what that peptide is, you go where the money is, you loot off that peptide from the MHC of SARS-CoV-2 infected cells or expressing cells, and then you run it through a tandem mass spec with a bunch of algorithms that we then use to sort of prioritize the peptides uh, that we have. And now this is supposed to be a T cell with a T cell receptor. And what I'm showing here is that we not only we pull out the peptide, but we validate its immunogenicity, meaning that um, that peptide is not only processed and presented on the surface of a virus infected cell, um, but that you can induce a T cell response. And that T cell response comes from normal human peripheral blood um, mononuclear cells. That T cell response is sufficient to recognize um, an infected cell. So it has sufficient affinity to recognize that target and that peptide is presented with sufficient density that this interaction can occur and leads to killing. And I'll talk about the TCRT in just a minute. But I think this is the structure we're talking about. This is a SARS-CoV-2 genome. There's beating frames 1A and 1B. There's a spike protein everyone knows about sticking on the surface. And then a whole bunch of accessory genes that are associated with uh, the structure. Um, membrane glycoprotein, MGP, nucleocapsid. Uh, uh, this one we're going to talk about in just a minute. Now, remember, there's a whole huge part of the gene dedicated just to survival uh, and function of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The spike protein, as it turns out, people have gone and looked at T cell responses, just looking at this part of the spike protein because, oh, well, you know, it's accessible, let's go for it. And they've come across a number of peptides. So you can see these are a list of peptides, some nine some longer shown along here. And a number of different individuals have published on this and have made a big deal of the fact that there are immunodominant responses, that they're dominant T cell major responses, not only in people infected with SARS-CoV-2, but apparently in healthy donors as well. And so if you look, just visually these tall bars here um, uh, represent what they other scientists have called uh, immunodominant responses and it turns out oh my goodness they're also found in healthy individuals who've never been exposed to sars cov 2 as, as they know so they're saying oh well there's some cross reactivity and so on and this makes it like a great story and i'm not saying it's not true but i'm saying it's flawed and, and the reason it's flawed is that People have taken a whole bunch of different peptide epitopes, um, and you can see here the whole list uh, coming from different parts of the protein. Uh, and they've looked at responses in patients, and they see variable responses, um, and that's great. And in fact, if you look in the Meta Bio Archive, there are 2,000 class one epitopes and 1,400 class two epitopes. So these are all predicted. Now, just so you understand even more deeply into why I'm a little bit uh, passionate about this, is that you can take any peptide that binds the MHC very well, that's predicted to bind. So you just map along the sequence. You throw that into PBMC, you're gonna get a T cell response. Now, whether that peptide is actually presented with a T cell response is relevant or not, for the most part, and you know, this is a controversial statement probably, is that all these studies ignore that fact. 
They just want to know there's reactivity. And some of it may be hit, some of it may not. But we decided, okay, let's go for it. Let's see for these immunodominant epitopes, people are predicted, okay, they're all predicted. Do they actually generate a T cell that recognizes target? And unfortunately, we did all this <laughs> work Kay did actually generate T cells. We pulled them out, we expanded, we sorted them. You can see it's a nice cluster, meaning they're all engine specific for this peptide epitope. They do not recognize the uh, uh, SARS CoV 2 expressing targets. So, zero flat, completely flat. You can see that right here. So, not relevant as far as we're concerned from an imaging standpoint. So, these are predicted, but they don't list the response to recognize this T cell. What do we do instead? We, 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 we went for the money. We went after the peptide. We did the mass spec analysis. We looked at all these genes. And in order to make this as effective as possible, we um, engineered uh, angio presenting cells to express these different parts of the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and with different HLA alleles to be as broad as possible in the coverage, you can see we highlighted here, non-structural protein, uh, membrane glycoprotein. Uh, we did the analysis. Um, we ran it against the database to make sure that these uh, genes actually are expressed. And so this is how we substituted what we used to use tumors now, but now we use the SARS CoV 2 engineered cell. And then we ran through this protocol, as I explained to you earlier, we generated T cells against these peptide epitopes and then tested if these T cells do, in fact, uh, kill the engineered cell. And this is an example of a mass spec, and you can deconvolute to get a peptide sequence. Um, and this is what we got. Okay, we published five of these, but there's actually 18 of these. And you can see that four of them. Um, are found in a non-structural protein. One of them is found in membrane glycoprotein. And the top line is the sequence. We took the sequence from SARS-CoV-2 and we compared it to all the sequences in the other coronavirus families. And we see there's some uh, identity and there's also some misidentity. Um, and it's possible that, you know, if you were previously exposed to one of these, um, sorry, one of these other viruses, you may still elicit a response to the um, SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell. Um, that's interesting. It's just interesting. But what's more interesting is that turns out these targets, and I've shown again the same five targets here in the non-structural protein region and also the memory glycoprotein protein region, is that they're highly conserved among all the variants, alpha variant, and I don't show delta variant, but the delta variant as well. These are the uh, uh, variations, but you can see there's no variation. And you know, it's highly conserved, partly because the non-structural proteins may be responsible for helicase activity and so on. So we did this whole process that I did before for the predicted immunodominant dominant found no responses, but here we did it. And we showed that uh, in summary, that these T cells, they do respond to the peptides for targets, but they also respond um, against um, the uh, uh, endogenous expensive membrane driver protein, lots of killing here, lots of killing here. Um, and I can show you the same thing for all four of them, uh, five of them all together, the nice killing. Um, so these are, we believe, immunogenic relevant. Just to complete the nuts of the bolts, I've got uh, 30 seconds over time, sorry. Um, the last point I'm gonna make here is that we're gonna pull out the T cell receptor and prove in fact that that T cell receptor can transfer specificity. Um, so here we are cloning our T cell receptor, transfer specificity, non-specific T cells, just random peripheral lymphocytes and also recognize, and we, we do that, it's published and just to prove from nuts to bolts that, you know, Predicting does not lead to SARS-CoV-2 coding, but in fact, what you need to do is do the elution, or sorry, do the eluted peptide. Uh, some of them are predicted, of course, among the 4,000 are predicted, but you have to go after the specific ones that are eluted, and we actually have a whole bunch now, not just against spike and we're protein, but sort of non-NSP uh, helicases. Um, and I think that the question that we want to answer is, you know, is this assay with a more select group of peptide epitopes, these T cell epitopes, going to be relevant for looking at these T cell responses in more detail. You don't throw in those three or 4,000 uh, and then hope that you'll get some uh, relevancy. And I think um, these are the questions that we're going to be asking um, as we move forward. And then the last thing I want to make, uh, not everybody knows about Maurice Hillerman. He's, he's a hero. He should be considered a superhero. He saved millions of lives literally because of vaccine strategies that he implemented for a lot of childhood diseases, rubella and so on, mumps, measles, rubella. And also, uh, Zhang Yang Jian, who literally within 48 hours turned over the SARS-CoV-2 genome into the public domain, for which BioNTech, Pfizer, and everybody else has made billions of dollars uh, making these vaccines and saving lives. And it was because of his work that really we, we get to where we are as quickly as we can. And I just want to thank everyone here and proven fact that this was a supplement <laughs> that came out of a pancreatic cancer grant and led to this sort of collaboration. So I thank the Commons for allowing us to uh, um, display some of this work. Thank you so much. To stop sharing there. Well, thank you so much, Cassie. And that's, um, it's so great to hear that there are so many ways that this type of research is evolving out of different, uh, you know, sometimes unexpected arenas. And that's kind of what we're hoping to do today. And Liz, yes. 
Um, our final speaker for today is Liz Goldberg, who is an emergency medical physician at the Miriam and Rhode Island Hospitals and an associate professor of emergency medicine, associate professor of health services, policy, and practice at Brown University. Um, Liz, yeah, take it away. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. And now we're really going to move um, back to very patient facing um, clinical research. And I'm excited to present our work on uh, meeting the health needs of older adults uh, via telehealth. And this was a, a supplement to my K award that is primarily about fall prevention in older individuals um, also using to some technology. So thank you um, to the National Institute on Aging and to uh, my research lab. So the COVID pandemic has really threatened healthcare delivery to older adults, 65 and older. In a representative survey of over a thousand US older adults, 39% stated that they delayed non-essential treatment, 32% delayed preventative care, and 15 delayed essential treatment. And so telehealth emerged as an option to keep older adults safe in their homes, but also to provide this missing um, health care. And you can see in these two graphs that both consumers and physicians had a increased uptake of telehealth, and we expect that telehealth uh, use will increase over the coming years. So it's important for us to understand how can we make sure that older adults are included in this technology. Uh, just to illustrate how much the uptake has been, there's a 154% increase in telehealth visits in March, 2020, the first month after the pandemic started compared to the year prior and 44% of Medicare primary care visits were via telehealth in April 2020, compared to only 0.1% in February. So this was a big opportunity for our lab to study how telehealth is being implemented by physicians on the front lines to help older adults access telehealth. So our aims were to identify telehealth strategies used during the pandemic, and we conducted semi-structured interviews um, our aim was to complete between 36 and 54 with geriatricians, primary care, and emergency physicians. And why this group? It's because this group was really the first line response to the COVID pandemic and was responsible not only for public health, helping people understand when to go to the hospital, where to get testing, how to treat their symptoms, um, but also to keep chronic health issues um, at bay. And we did these interviews at starting in um, July, and they continue through November of 2020. And we really explored what were the telehealth services you provided or abandoned? What kind of modes did you use? And by modes, we're talking about, did you use apps? Did you use um, audio visual? Did you make phone calls? We also asked about facilitators and barriers and sort of practical considerations in providing care remotely. And currently we're on aim two of this supplement and we're using those qualitative interviews to do item generation and, and do a web-based national survey of these physicians to understand the scope of use. So our methods included purpose of purpose of sampling to recruit these three specialists from all geographic regions and practice settings. So it's important to us to not only to speak to academic physicians, but also um, speak to community physicians in rural and urban settings. We conducted these interviews via 30 minute semi-structured remote interviews via Zoom. And we developed a code book a priori. We double coded our transcripts in in vivo. And we used framework analysis because it's a wonderful way to not only include learners in qualitative analysis, but it's also very expedited. And we knew that our results were important to help structure how telehealth was used in the future. So we were, ended up recruiting 48 participants. And you can see here, we were successful in recruiting both academic community and, and um, physicians that practice in metro, suburban, and rural areas. Our median age was 37.5. And I will say that is quite young. We did recruit over social media in part, um, in addition to listservs. And so I think that is why uh, more younger physicians were attracted to this research. We had um, 21 men and 27 women physicians included. And on average, they were in practice for seven years. Approximately 58% 
of physicians we included had used some form of telehealth, including phone calls with their patients prior to uh, COVID-19. And 29% of physicians reported using video visits before March 2020. So a full two thirds of our cohort had actually never done a video visit with a patient in their seven in their average of seven years of practice prior to, to, to this pandemic. And I want to share some representative quotes with you because I think it's important to, to know how we're, how we're using telehealth with these older adults. Uh, one geriatrician told us, I'm lucky at the VA, we can actually send VA issued iPads to people who need them to start a mobile home visit. And one of the themes that we noted throughout all of our interviews was that shortage in devices or not having a device or not having broadband internet access was a major access barrier for older adults, um, also for rural patients and under-resourced um, patients such as homeless patients and um, folks that were of lower socioeconomic status. One of our primary care physicians said, our staff calls patients a week ahead of time to make sure that they have the Zoom link and to help troubleshoot patients. So we actually found, one of the themes that we found is that it's not actually the age that makes it difficult for some folks to access telehealth, but it was a lack of exposure. So some older adults have a lot of exposure. They've used iPads before, they've done FaceTime before. They had an easier time accessing telehealth whereby there were some, um, even young older patients at between 65 and 75 that had never really used a computer to do anything healthcare related. And those folks really struggled. One of our emergency medicine physicians said, making sure they can hear you, making sure that you're talking at a cadence that works for them, that gives them the time to hear you, listen, process and respond. I think I would probably spend more time providing instructions. So our emergency physicians reported on using telehealth both in the hospital and also many practice telehealth outpatient to supplement their income because there was a large drop in volume to emergency departments early on in the pandemic. And so uh, there was an opportunity there for emergency physicians to um, offer telehealth um, at, in, in the home as like a moonlighting opportunity. So some of the strategies we identified is that, particularly for older adults with sensory impairments such as hearing impairments, slow speaking speed was important, spending more time on instructions, leaving rooms for questions, and also mirroring the tone and formality used by older patients. One observation that physicians made is that younger patients were really comfortable with chat-based uh, telehealth and using really informal tones, whereas older adults prefer that the telehealth visit was more like an actual doctor's visit with professional titles used, and they appreciated that increased formality. Um, it was also found to be important to discuss telehealth privacy concerns. Many patients were concerned that um, about Zoom bombing or that uh, their personal health information would be exposed to others if they used an audiovisual format. And so um, educating surrounding how these telehealth modalities could be HIPAA compliant um, really helped improve um, acceptability. And in the emergency department, some of the uh, concerns that emergency physicians mentioned was that it was often difficult to have patients start their own devices, especially patients with cognitive impairment were very confused about how to get the device to start that was in their, in their patient room. And so they often um, needed to have nurses or, or techs go into the room and set that up. Or if, if there were mounted devices that automatically turned on, that was the best solution. And emergency physicians also stated that these devices that they used in the hospital helped them um, during times where there was limited PPE, because every single time that you go into a hospital room, you had to gown up and then gown back down. And that was one set of PPE that you could no longer use. So by having a device mounted in the room, if there were new findings or you, or you decide to change uh, the course of the treatment, it was much easier to have this telehealth available in the room. So you could you could conserve that very valuable PPE. Some of the other quotations that we think illustrate strategies that physicians use include this by the emergency physician. Despite that, you can put the highest volume you can. Sometimes it's hard for them to hear well. So then in RED, we will try to give them hearing amplifiers if they don't have their hearing aids. 
And this was another theme that in order to get around some of the hearing issues, they supplied staff with better microphones and they also encouraged people to use Bluetooth connected um, devices for hearing. Um, a geriatrician said, some very passionate medical students did a lot of outreach to our patients. They spent hours with them one-on-one -on -one over the phone to teach them how to use video or Zoom. So very early on in the pandemic, medical students were often not allowed to go into hospitals and continue their clinical rotations. So many of the medical students volunteered to help orient um, patients, especially older patients, to how to use Zoom and how to use these technologies. One of our primary care physicians said, I have older people who barely know how to use a cell phone, let alone start a video. I rely, rely a lot on their family members, or if we can coordinate, if they have home services and we can coordinate with a visiting nurse, for instance, to help us with that. So it's um, really important that we, that we recognize the burden this has had on caregivers and also home health staff. Uh, they were really required to um, help us meet the health needs of older adults and help them with technology. And finally, there were barriers that um, were, came to light that need to be addressed. For instance, there were many medical legal concerns surrounding this diagnosis. Many emergency physicians said we really shouldn't be seeing abdominal pain or chest pain via telehealth. It's important to do a physical exam in those patients. Um, there are still many concerns with integrating the EHR with the telehealth platform. So sometimes the telehealth platform was on a separate EHR than the hospital EHR, or the one that they usually use. There's still a huge gap in offering telehealth to non-English speaking patients because of the lack of interpreter services and co coordination with interpreters via telehealth. Um, there's a need for more validated cognitive assessments that can be offered over an audiovisual format. Um, it's still a concern that there's not enough access to remote care for rural and low income patients. And many phys physicians said that they could have helped more patients if there was an option for cross-state licensure instead of only being licensed in one state. And finally, for, for telehealth to be sustainable, uh, really the reimbursement model needs to be competitive with in-person visits. Um, many older adults could only use a phone, they couldn't use other devices. And so if there's not um, similar payment for these phone calls as there is for in-person visits, it's gonna make it difficult for physicians to continue to offer that to older adults. So in conclusion, physicians describe varied, varied adoption of telehealth, but all increased telehealth use. Physicians identified many different strategies to optimize visits, and many of them had individual strategies that we really need to disseminate so, and teach in medical school so that these can become more broad, um, there can be broader uptake. And finally, to really enhance uptake and to ensure that telehealth continues to be offered as an option for healthcare delivery, we need to address liability concerns, enhance the interoperability, and address the needs of special populations with sensory impairments like hearing impairments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. I um, really appreciate all of your presentations this afternoon. Um, for the audience, let me just briefly say that each of our speakers' presentations will also be made available on our website, covidinfocommons.net, and on our YouTube channel later this week. So if you want to go back in, delve deeper into the content, um, there are plenty of occasions that you can, you can do all of that. Um, and before we segue into the Q&A session for today's webinar, there's lots of questions going around in the chat, so I know it's going to be a lively conversation. I'm going to briefly um, share my slide and just do um, one more piece of admin for the group, only to mention that we um, are going to continue this conversation with four new speakers in November, so please register, join us on November 15th which is a Monday um, for four more speakers who are gonna be talking about, again, even um, more diverse, um, interesting conversations around COVID. Um, so please, um, hope, we hope to see you then. And um, I think Florence, we were gonna make one final announcement to share with the community that the NSF has announced a new challenge to identify systemic strategies and address long-term impacts of COVID-19 on um, DEI initiatives in STEM. Um, we've provided some information here for the um, group. You can learn more at, at this link right here about this NSF challenge. Is there anything you want to add, Florence? Or 
No, I was just saying that it's open to all institutions of higher education, to your colleges, for your colleges. So if you go to that link, um, you can find out more about it. And the submission period is open until December 30th. So you have time to think about this and actually um, you know, participate if you would like. And I believe it's a $200,000 cash award. Um, so it's very interesting. And I'm really excited that they've actually announced that. So thank you for mentioning that, Warren. Absolutely, it's um, relevant to the community and we want to share that with um, the audience here today. Um, and finally, let me just share some information about how you can remain in contact with the COVID Info Commons um, community even beyond our upcoming events. Um, I'm going to drop all of these links and details into the chat for you guys to look over and ruminate while we're engaging in today's uh, Q&A session. Um, so I'm going to do that right now. Um, but so now I think we'd like to open it up to the Q&A from our audience. Um, several people have already posted comments and questions. Thank you for that. Um, and I think Florence, you're gonna kick us off, right? And, and bring us up to speed on, on what's happening in the, in the audience. Absolutely. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you everyone for your presentations. I always find this fascinating. As Miranda said, I always learn so much when we come to these. Um, and actually, I'm going to go in reverse order. And I know that um, Liz, you answered this in the chat, but Miranda Lynch uh, was asking about tutorials and, um, you know, were there questionnaires to assess whether the physician surveyed asked whether their geriatric, geriatric patients needed tutorials to engage with the telehealth. Listening to you, um, it makes me think about how I've been thinking of uh, digital candy stripers. Remember the candy stripers years ago? They would walk around and help you. Would you like a book? You want a magazine? Now it's like, can I help you with FaceTime? You know, so do you see that as a trend? Are they calling them digital candy stripers or am I too old and no one uses that term anymore? Yeah, you know, that that's a great question, Miranda. And I think the issue was that no one was prepared for this. There were very few physicians that we interviewed that said, oh, we're ready successfully using telehealth. We have our EHR up and running. We have all these different modes. What we heard for the most part is it was totally chaotic. Our older physicians often struggled initially to even figure out how to make this happen. And, and CMS fortunately was pretty flexible and said, you know, you can use phone calls, you can, um, you can actually FaceTime and use some of these other technologies initially to get this up and running was the most important thing is to bring health to older, uh, older adults. But now what we're seeing now, you know, 18 months, 19 months into this is that a lot of physician educators and other educators are saying, we really need to have a much more structured approach to this and let's start offering tutorials and videos and other ways to orient, orient folks. And, and that will work for a certain subpopulation, but I, but I will say patients with uh, pretty severe cognitive impairment, those in facilities like in nursing homes, assisted living, um, some of them will, will always be challenged by telehealth as a modality. And so um, often the telehealth is more directed towards their caregiver or a facility nurse or someone else that's there. And fortunately, you can still offer healthcare that way. But I would say there's still a lot of challenges to overcome. There's a lot of opportunity, but um, that's a really great point, Miranda. And thanks for asking it. Very good. Yeah. And Liz, I would say that if anyone's interested in thinking about, you know, digital candy stripers or care angels, I think there was a town in Italy, I have to look it up again, where um, they actually had technology, they could tell if like an older person who lived on their own, um, didn't like use the gas or the water by a certain time in the morning, and they would send somebody over to make sure they're okay. You know, so you can actually have people in the community that might be a nice little like, you know, uh, opportunity for some people, um, you know, in their spare time when they're not, you know, riding, driving Ubers or something, you know, like that they could actually help with that because, you know, a lot of people wait for their kids or grandkids to come to use the technology. So it's just a thought. So if you want to put a proposal and you want someone to help, let me know, because I think it would be a great thing to get going and actually create um, a community like that. Okay, great. So, uh, Sunny, are you still on? We have a couple of questions for you. Yeah, there you are. Hi. Great. So uh, one of the questions was from Miranda. Does droplet size of the aerosol have an effect um, on the problem you were discussing? Oh. And uh, does it dictate how many um, virant particles can be contained? Yes, um, actually I responded in the chat and then privately to herself, but oh, okay. yeah, if you want to uh, talk broadly very much and the size of the droplet, actually the bigger droplet may contain more viruses in the droplet, but this settles really quickly. And so they don't really uh, um, have a, such a big impact. 
fact. And then um, because when it's generated by flashing and it settles out of the air and it's not in the zone of the next person is entering the toilet room and then the lighter uh, droplets are floating around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so that's number one. Number two is also in your breathing system, the phys physiology of our breathing system, we filter out the large droplet and before it entered the lungs. And so, yes, and there's a lot of details in there. Um, you know, this is the lightning talk. And so that's a great question. So um, thank you. Is there anywhere they can go to learn more? Do you have like a paper that's published? Yeah, yes. The, the paper is published in the science of the total environment. It's very detailed, too much math in there, maybe for, <laughs> uh, because each of the models, there are sub models to it and just yeah. the, how the aerosol is generated, how it settles and the, the people's breathing patterns and each of them are a separate model by itself. Uh, would you like to drop the, the link yeah, the I can, I can into that. the chat? Yeah, while, while you're asking other questions, okay. I will do that. That would be really great. Thank you very much. And then uh, Susan, we have a question for you. I see you're ready. Um, are you able to track differences in engagement with healthcare for the patients in your study? Many people reduced visits to healthcare even when they had serious issues like cancer, like some of our other presenters were mentioning too. Absolutely. Um, I, I mentioned that we have more data than I know what to do with. Um, we, I have not done anything with that, but we do have the ability to know when um, study participants were at the clinic and on if they missed a, a radiation treatment or a chemotherapy treatment. Um, and certainly qualitatively, people told us that. And we um, but how far did it push them back? I think um, to add to that um, is some of the follow-up care that um, th that is really necessary after surgery or during chemo. Um, I think women um, kind of just, um, they needed those candy stripers. They, no, they did because they, you know, they, especially those women that lived alone, they had mm -hmm. no one for support um, when they didn't feel well or if they needed to get somewhere. And so sometimes, you know, and didn't feel well enough to travel anywhere and no one wanted to go visit them because no one wanted to spread COVID to someone who um, is post-operatively or is post-operative. But yes, so definitely. Yeah. Um, but the, that is really important data that we need to get to. Um, okay. Very good. Well, if you need help on the data, um, you know, feel free to, you know, reach out and we can chat and maybe we can see if there are some people that we can, you know, help you engage with uh, on that. Um, either locally or, you know, everything's digital now and virtual. So yes, thank um, you. Thank my pleasure. Yeah, this is a community, you know, we're a collaboration hub. That's what we do. We bring people together um, and help collaborative research move things forward. Um, you know, another thing I'll just mention, I know my daughter during COVID was a shopping angel, um, which was really cute. So, um, and so there was an elder el couples that people didn't want to go out, doesn't really matter. And, um, but one of them had was having heart surgery during COVID. So, you know, his wife was like, we're not going anywhere. Um, and so she would go grocery shopping for them and leave it outside, you know, whatever. But now that, you know, people can be a little more proximate, you know, it could be, like I said, that there's some type of angels, you know, digital healthcare angels, or maybe with the meals on wheels, like, you know, meals and, iPhones on wheels. I don't know what it would be, you know, but, you know, there could be models where we could actually help engage because they, they do need help. You know, I know my, uh, my sister, who's quite a bit older, who's really my aunt, long story, but she's in her mid eighties. And um, she just graduated from a flip phone. Her daughter just bought her an iPhone so she can actually see the pictures now that we want to send her, you know? Um, and so some of them still do have, you know, little clamshell phones or flip phones. They really, they can engage, you know? So, um, so I think it would be great if we could find a way to help them overall, because it's not just going to be during, you know, COVID it's because they can't get out anyway, you know, and if we can bring healthcare to them that way, it helps in so many other cases, I think. We find that all the time with our, our, um, as, as breast cancer surgery, um, becomes available for older women. You know, when I first started looking at this, if women, we had very, very few women over 70. And now we have many women that are in their 80s that are being scheduled for breast cancer. They're healthy. They have no reason not to have the surgery, but they're oftentimes the ones that do not have a computer or, and want us to call them instead of emailing them or texting them. Um, so agreed, that's, that's certainly the population that 
uh, that Liz is working with that sounds that is just uh, tremendous, I think. It is, and it will all be there at some point if we're lucky, right? That we'll be that old, that there's new technology where, you know, people are going to be using, you know, brain computer interfaces and there'll be like, you know, holograms walking around in our room and we'll be all worried that we don't have our bathrobes on or whatever, you know, but um, it's going to continue the use of technology in, in this, uh, we're all aging. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm kidding. Um, okay. So I think uh, most of the other questions have been answered. I just want to um, ask for your question out loud, um, Sunny, regarding um, one of the questions that was earlier that we, I didn't ask you out loud. So does it help to wear a mask with all these little droplets in the bathrooms? <laughs> well, <laughs> a, a, yes, if you go to a public uh, bathroom, there's a lot of people I think it's helpful, but there's very limited evidence to show that the feces, the viral genome detected in the feces are infectious. And so a lot of clinicians and then tried, uh, you know, over and over try to isolate the infectious viruses and it's very challenging. There's only, you know, a handful of research showing that the viruses can be isolated in very low concentration. So there is a paper reported by Stanford showing that although the intestine, small intestine have the receptor cells for amplification of the viruses in the intestine. The large intestine produce a fluid inactivated a lot of the viruses. And then so the infectious viruses shedded in the, in the feces are really a big debate. Um, so don't be overly panic. And even I assume, um, you know, in my risk model, I make a one to 1000 uh, conversions to say the genome, only 1000 genome equal one infectious viruses, that infectious rate is very low. So yes, um, you know, currently you should wear a mask anyway. That's true. And maybe throw it out after you go to a public bathroom. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay, very good. Well, I think we've, um, we've gotten to a lot of the questions. Oh, and then uh, Susan just asked a question of Sunny. She'd be very interested to know if you've looked at patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, that have low maximum forced rates. Um, no, the answer is no. I, um, those are a lot of questions that are very interesting to address. And so um, the reason why I got into the toilet flushing is because we used to assess the water reuse. You know, in California, we use uh, wastewater for toilet flushing. And what is, the, what is the right amount of passage you allow in those toilet flushing water and then to, to have no health effect. And so we just applied a similar approach, approach to the COVID. I have and look deeper into that. Um, so thank you. That's a great question. Very good questions. And also a couple of other researchers that have presented on the KIC webinars before regarding, regarding wastewater and COVID. Uh, one of them was out of Rice University that had an NSF rapid award. Um, and then there was another one recently as well that, oh, yeah. there's a, a gentleman. We have one coming there. up next month, actually, um, on November 15th. Um, uh, one of our speakers who's coming from the University of Miami is talking about wastewater monitoring. So it's, it's uh, Alina Polo Gabriel, right? Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, we are a very large network in the country, and everybody is looking at the wastewater surveillance. And I think, you know, um, the, the, the cell and interaction, the cancer and all those are really really interesting research, you know, uh, it's a big learning curve for me, but I guess the sewage is more close home, <laughs> so there's more interest. And it's there. everywhere, yeah. Yeah. Urban and rural, it's everywhere. Okay, great. Are there any other um, questions that anybody has or comments? Well, the presentations have been wonderful and the discussion. Oh, I'm sorry, Cassie, were you going to say something? I, I'm just going to ask Sunny, which is, you know, when, when you collect these samples for surveillance, um, is there a repository so, you know, if people are tracking other diseases or in the chemotherapy field, we've been looking at the fecal microbiome for the reasons. Is that a repository that's publicly available or something that, that can be shared? Um, we do have sample, a um, um, little bit sample archive, and then you asked the fluid. I'm trying to address that, but I couldn't type fast enough. Sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there are people try to sequencing fluid and other, we use it, the pan coronaviruses as a amplify, amplification, but the signal in the sewage is a little bit challenging for the sequencing work. And so we're, um, um, 
and we are have archived the cDNA um, from the from the viral research and actually UC Irvine is uh, is doing massive manhole sewer manhole studies and potentially I'll have more sewage sample coming out of uh, UCI manholes and so Helena uh, next next time will will show all the studies they have done at University of Miami and then okay. uh, there's a lot of those questions you asked about different viruses okay. variants and then uh, how the variants is present and so those are, are are you know very nice question to ask the last question is uh do you think people should install total devices in all their toilets <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know no, yeah back flushing at the time yeah depends on yeah generate a lot of aerosols that way yeah. okay. mm. can i add to that question because i i was actually thinking about hospitals where I mean, there's toilets being flushed everywhere, constantly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of the older hospitals, I've worked in many hospitals, um, you know, where we actually would have, um, we'd have leak, it, you know, we'd have, um, well, we'd have toilet problems and they would leak and you'd have to bring the plumber in and the, the floor below us would have um, infiltration of that leak. Mm -hmm. Is there... Like, is there something that hospitals now have to do as part of the COVID protocol? I haven't worked in the hospital for a while. I don't think that's a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. And I mean, I work in the emergency department and we definitely have a lot more of these air purifiers all oh. over uh -huh. um, because not all of our rooms are negative pressure, um, but I, they haven't made any modifications to the bathrooms. <laughs> Sorry. And miles to go before we sleep, like Robert Frost said, right? Miles to go before we sleep. You know, one thing I'd like to do, I'm going to share my screen quickly, is um, this is the COVID information commons itself. And, you know, Cassie and I was thinking when you were asking your question, like if you wanted to put wastewater here as a keyword search, you wanted to see who had data sets, um, it'll give you a list of um, currently NSF, someday NIH, <laughs> uh, you know, research that, um, you know, with the researchers and, uh, you know, you could look at them, maybe you know some of the people, maybe you know where they are, maybe they're close to you, um, and you could actually check out some of their research. Um, and for some of them, if they've, um, if they've provided information in their PI survey, there'll also be a link to their ORCID ID and things like that. So, um, so feel free to, you know, leverage this. Um, this is a free tool for everyone to use. As I say, your tax dollars at work, better than driving around construction. Um, and so here's an example, Joe Brown filled in his uh, PI survey. So we have his ORCID ID with a hot link there, some of his project related websites, um, and then information on collaboration opportunities as an example. And if you click on his keywords, let's say wastewater epidemiology, it'll bring you back to this search mechanism and then it'll bring up the ones that have wastewater and epidemiology. So it's a, it's a data set that you know, we encourage you to use um, and you know, hopefully all your awards will be in it before long. Uh, we're, we're getting you know, the NIH award, we're preparing to um, Get the NIH awards in here too, which I think will be great. So, so just out of curiosity, what is the scope of this? Um, just, can you give me a number? How many different grants or people or topics are, are put in there? Because I was wondering, um, you know, I know Emily Anson is doing this, but I'm sure every other major center is applying NLP to some of their um, databases to to enable searches. Yeah, yeah there. So, um, with this COVID Info Commons, there are 990 awards in here right now. They're all NSF funded awards. It was as of last October. So, we okay. put in the rapid awards first, and then we put in all the other awards. There are a bunch of awards, as you can see, but there are going to be a bunch more with the American Rescue Plan Act. So, we're going to be extending the COVID Info Commons with our new Kiki Award, which is a four year, um, $2 million award to bring in all the NIH awards, to bring in all the new NSF awards related to COVID. Um, over the next four years. And we also in here link to um, data sets. So we have people that send us data sets, you know, it links to data sets. Um, we don't have the data sets, we link to all of them. We have 50 or 70 of them in here. I've encountered them recently. You know, in North America, there's a bunch of NIH stuff, Google stuff, Johns Hopkins, you know, Safe Graph, a bunch of things, South America, oh, okay. Europe, Asia, Australasia, okay. Africa. <laughs> you know, so people send us this stuff because they know we're here and it's open and available around the planet. And so you could link through to any of these and, uh, and take a peek. And if you know of some we don't have in here, feel free to send us an email. 
Um, and uh, we'd be happy to, we vet them first. You know, we try to make this, you know, a trusted authority as people say they want this to be a trusted authority. So that's how, how we handle it. And we're gonna keep adding to it. And then all of your lightning talks will be in here and meet the researchers. You know, we have the webinars and then we have the separate lightning talks. We even have some from our students. We have a student paper challenge uh, every year. We had our inaugural one. And this is one of the students who actually is a high school student who was a junior at the same time at the University of Minnesota when he applied and he won third place. God bless him, right? Makes, yeah. makes us feel really inadequate, doesn't it? But uh, so anyway, his uh, video and a bunch of the others are in here too and yours will be here as well. So you could actually um, look there too. Yeah, so Thank these you. are, yeah, this is great. Any other questions, you know, we'd be happy um, to help and you can always come here and look at, yeah, here's the student paper challenge winners as an example. Um, and so here we have Samson from UCSD, Aditya from Minnesota, and then Jane just didn't want her picture here. She was at Columbia, now she's at Princeton, um, going for her PhD, I think. So that's all I wanted to share so that we could all see. And um, I think that's, that's it. It's at 1.27 p.m. Eastern. We really want to thank everybody for your great participation um, and uh, Hope to see you again next time. Lauren, thank you very much as always. And thank you to all of our speakers and participants.